Hulkamania fans. We are live. Hulkamania is running wild. So, yeah. So, that's Macho Man, dude. You run it. So, okay. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. I want to give a special thanks to Q in the studio, KVAR. If you want to head over to KVAR.com or in the KVAR studios, I want to thank everybody here. I am really excited about this guest today. So, so we formed a, a friendship and a relationship through a mutual friend, and um, not something I take lightly. Of course, um, you know I have the utmost respect for the, a lot of the guys, as everybody knows, that are behind the scenes doing what we do. And I like to think of this guy as one of the guys that's operating at a higher level that not everybody can fully understand and appreciate, but I do. And the reason I do is because I've had guests in like Bruce Cardenas from Quest and other guests that they're the guys making it happen for the people out there. And I can appreciate that because in the gun industry that's something I've prided myself on. So I super appreciate what this guy does behind the scenes and now what he's doing and putting his story out there in the front of the house. I want to thank Hans from Monster Energy for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So I want to dive right in, as we always do, to your story and kind of how you got here from San Diego and how you kind of got to this place that you're at in life as the guy to go to in that energy drink market. Well, I mean, uh, I started in action sports, which is you know primarily skateboarding. Surfing, motocross, um, the the alternative world of, um, of sports that was you know at all, for many years not looked upon you know favorably by any companies or any markets. But uh, I grew up skateboarding and surfing in um, San Diego, California. So naturally, I you know as, as I was looking to see what I was going to do with my career moving forward after school, I um, I jumped into the action sports market. And, which I worked for numerous brands, but one of the mainstay brands I was at for a long time was a company called Osiris Shoes, which um, I was there for close to 18 years. And um, through Osiris Shoes, I you know, um, started working with and developing relationships with other brands that I now currently work with and continue to build and brand and build for. You know, I wanted, to ask, I wanted to ask you this, and I want to ask you it on air, because it's a question, Bruce and I, what goes into brand building the most that people don't see? How important are relationships, and, and what goes into it behind the scenes? Because I have such a deep appreciation for what you're doing, and I know Bruce would too. What do you do that you feel never gets, people never see? Look. Obviously, with it, with with the digital age and social media, people see the story that, that they want to see, right? So they see you with athletes, they see you with people that you know they feel are um, you know they're, they're heroes or they're they're notable collaborators. Yeah, and so well, what I do and what's being done that people don't get to see is is we make the magic happen, and um, and that's really putting people with brands and then utilizing those people to build a story behind not only their personal brand, but with the brand that they're representing. And um, for the last you know, 20 some years of my career, I've taken the approach of doing everything hands on from shooting photos myself to you know, um, collaborating with different brands for different athletes obviously negotiating all the deals for the for, for the brands that I work for and then, you know, making sure that the athletes I hold their end of the bargain. And then we do a lot of cross promotion with the retailers and, and the people that that um, support the brands that uh, these athletes are, are representing. So really what brand building is, is getting, you know, multiple people, it's, you know, whether it's a, it's a an athlete or, or, or some sort of um, or influencers, you know, and having the, you know them utilize the brand that you're selling or you're, you're promoting, and getting it out there properly, and I help them do that. I, I show them the way of creating the content. I show them the way of you know um, explaining what the content, you know, what the what the brand is. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, you know, just coaching them through the process. So that we can get the, we can um, maximize the full results of utilizing them as a endorser of the brand. Do you find it hard, you know? And this is, uh, 
you know, question, you know, a lot of guys maybe aspiring to be in your shoes or be in the lifestyle. Do you find it hard with some brands articulating that to the owners? Well, you know, yes and no. I mean, for many years, it, you know, I, I did the, it was, it was a classic working for one company and we all kind of, we all worked together from, you know, the, from the marketing and the sales side to figure out what products we were going to launch and, and who was going to be responsible for what when it came to the marketing aspect of it, like which, which athletes would be pushing that product or how we were going to get it out. Now, you know, I represent multiple brands, so they know what they're getting when they sign up with me. They know that they're going to get the network and they're going to get the, the access that I have and they're also going to get all the, um, you know, collaborative materials that I will provide to make sure that these athletes go and represent these brands properly so that they can get fully maximized and there's actually, you know, quantifiable results from them paying out, you know, whatever they pay out to the athlete. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, that's, your story, so, you know, bring, brings home a lot of stuff to me. I, I started out working with multiple companies in the tactical industry. Social media was new, it was starting out. Um, nobody really knew what it was, you know, when it was when it was coming to be. And like you said, you start out a little bit as a photographer, a little bit as a video guy. You're kind of feeling out what Facebook's all about. You're feeling out what what Instagram's all about. Being in my business, you're shunned from the beginning because similar to being in the extreme sports, it's it's shooting. Yeah. So being in the two A community and being in that business, everybody right away says, "Oh God, it's a gun," you know. And I remember back in the day posting, you know, me shooting a gun or me holding a gun, and people were like, "Oh my God, like this is crazy." Like, like you know you can't be doing that just like I'm sure you went through with skateboarding and different sports where it's like somebody's in a public place oh my god I can't believe they're doing this yeah I mean we I mean a, the majority of the stuff that we used to do was all based around you know I mean semi-illegal activity it was all legal yeah. I mean it was it was you know I mean, we were spending enormous amounts of money touring the world to find the legal places to go skateboard and that's what the allure was though and that's what made it cool was the fact that we basically were going out and you know, we had these athletes skateboarding in spots that were, you know, not supposed to be skateboarding at. There's a lot of security there. And they would go and they'd have a very limited amount of time to get something done. And, you know, when they would do that, that's the spectacle. That's what made it cool. And that's what actually propelled the sport to what it was. It was very, you know, it was very, you know, like it, the, it was very energetic. And it was, it was exciting to see somebody have a very short window to go and try to jump, you know, like all the way down. A twenty stair that they that they're running from, you right. know, security card, and you know we're all setting up like I'm setting up my camera, like I mean, like you know back in those days, you know when I was shooting film and we had a videographer there, we we all I mean we're we're talking about like strike force going in, getting it done, leaving. But if you get the shot, you know that's that those were the days again that that um this was all publication based, so you knew that you were going to get a cover, you knew that you were going to get a double page spread, you knew something big was going to come out of it, so it was worth it. Yeah, and I remember for us, I remember when I got in recoil, and Tony and I were in recoil, we were in like one of the same issues, and I remember I was like, I made it, but I'm like, nobody reads it, you know, it's like it was dying, it was a dying form, um, but that was for us like, still coming from that generation, it was like, you made it. It's crazy how, you know, certain things lead you to certain things. And, and you and I, I mean, I can definitely talk about this with you at length. You go from, you know, the skateboarding, the extreme sports, the sneaker business, the shoe business, and then that leads into other things like jujitsu and different things we're passionate about. I feel like in that culture in San Diego, the skateboarding and the jujitsu almost go hand in hand. Um, yeah, I mean, nowadays, I mean, when, when I first started, they didn't, you know, um, it was very separate and anything that had anything to do <laughs> with um, combat or or violence amongst another, which is insane if you really think about it now because skateboarders were like the antithesis of being like these anarchic kids. Yeah, I, I feel like like Jeremiah Vance is another one. You know, it, it, but it was, it was, so it was, it was just in the late 90s early 2000s, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. So I started doing it. I started training Thai boxing and jiu-jitsu um, because I was over <laughs> being around skateboarding so much and I wanted to do something a little bit different. And so I started doing that and then I started competing and then I got really deep into it. And then I just made a, just a decision as I was, you know, the vice president of marketing for a brand. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sponsor Dean Lister, who um, is a world-class, you know, jiu-jitsu, 
you know, practitioner slash coach slash fighter. I, I, I was training under him. He uh, he was he was making the jump from fighting in uh, King of the Cage to Pride at the time. Um, we were all like our team was was very tight, and that team was Dean Lister and Jocko Willenick, and um, you know we had a couple other team guys down there that all trained together. And those guys were you know those guys were doing their thing. They were you know the team guys were going out and doing their work. And, I was doing a whole different line of work from a different place, but we all, you know, congregated around the mat and came very close. So I sponsored Dean um, for a couple of fights, and I saw some results that I didn't think I was gonna, what was going to happen, and it was actually somewhat positive. So I continued on working in that direction, which ultimately ended up making me go and start switching into a different field from action sports. It's crazy how the map brings people together in some ways because you just kind of go into it with one, you know, notion, thinking like, oh, it's going to be all these tough guys and everyone's trying to be tough. Yeah. But it really is a, a brotherhood there when you get there. And I've formed lifelong friendships, you know, in that space. And a lot of those folks have been with you for a long time. And you have relationships that just transcend everything and they just stay with you. And yeah. it's, it's amazing. Um, it's one of the things I didn't expect coming out of mixed martial arts and jiu-jitsu and that field. Just the camaraderie that comes with it and, and how much love there really is. Yeah, yeah you're, you're spending, spending a lot of time, time you know, with, with, with other people that you're, I mean, you, <laughs> trust, you, you, you trust them. them. You're, you're, they're, you're, obviously, you're, the, the goal is to submit and hurt them, but at the same time, like, the last thing you want to do is injure them to the point where they can't train anymore. So. There's, There's a definite, definite trust that has to go into, you know, having and picking good training partners. And the ones that you stay with for years and years and years, obviously there's a different synergy amongst them too. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you don't um, forget, you know, who has been with you from that period and who you can trust and who you can trust with your body. That's really one of the biggest things. I, you know, really admire your path and kind of where you came from and, and what you've done and what you've been able to do bringing brands together. And I have the most admiration for guys that are able to see the weaving of those different worlds and see how those different worlds can play into each other. It's really something that I know a lot of guys struggle with it. I had you know Jason in here from Microtech guys, he was explaining you know, the struggle to, to bridge the gap between the knife world, guys in fitness, guys in these different areas. What have you seen that's been helpful to you to bridge that gap and explaining it to owners and you know presidents of marketing divisions. How do you get that message across that like, look, you know, we want to get money from everybody, just not one community. Results. You know what I mean? Like, look, I mean, I mean, nobody's. Start, I mean, it's very, very rare that you're going to just start a company because you're so passionate. You don't want to make any money, and you know, you want to keep it one way. And and that's it. I mean, obviously there are companies like that, but realistically, you're, you're everyone's in business to somewhat, somewhat won't monetize, won't monetize an object that they're trying to sell on the market, and they want to, you know, it's a business. You want to make money. So to do that, you for me, it's always been about results, showing the metrics, showing the results. You know, nowadays you, you could have, you know, visual insights on about anything, like everything's visible. You know, there's, there's transparency you know, amongst anything that you're doing out there that you're going to, you're going to like put together as far as, you know, a, a social media plan or something, right? So what I do now, if, if, if it, and this has happened, if I'm working with companies or I'm working with, um, Skeptical, you know, individuals that that aren't certain on how something's going to work, or they don't know if, if, if it's, if it's going to be journey into a place or a path that, like, they don't see the path. You know, that 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 may not be, you know, traditionally where the brain used to be. I'll I'll just start. I'll put together things, you know, very low risk things, so that they can see. And I'll I'll, I'll guide them through it. I'll walk them through, like, hey, look, okay, so. For instance, for say say mixed martial arts, say say you know you're you're a company and, and you've been doing only I'm just gonna use this for example. You've only been doing CrossFit, right? And you've only done it. You've never been, you never you didn't want to venture outside of CrossFit just because you thought that if you venture outside of CrossFit, you're gonna lose you're gonna lose your core and your base customer because you're doing something different. Well, what I would do is, is I wouldn't obviously I would have never abandoned the the root of 
the um, you know the the, the, the people and the um, the base and the base that, that got there, I would just slowly integrate people and new you know and new things into what's pre-existing. And I'll give you an example of how that's worked recently with Monster Energy, for instance. Is that um, you know as I run the Combat Sports Division, which is comprised of you know, 40 different athletes, the best athletes in the world when it comes to martial arts, you know, mixed martial arts, from Conor McGregor, Rampage Jackson, John Jones, Danny Cormier, we have the best team. Undoubtedly, like, that's ever been built in any, um, you know, MMA, you know, sporting, you know, competition team. There's nothing better than a monster energy team. Well, recently, you know, um, I've, I've started including and adding people outside of the mixed martial arts, which would be guys like Flex Lewis, guys like Tony Real World Tactical, you know, um, different people that um, aren't traditionally involved in any, you know, um, real competition aspect of, of mixed martial arts, but obviously admire, maybe use some training within, and definitely have associations with it, you know, so um, we've also got Big Boy from Strength Cartel, like these three guys, all three of them, they all fit unique um, positions in the athletic and sporting community that I believe all kind of like, they all have someone to be on a relationship. And so as I added one of them, I, you know, I'll, I'll add them on and I'm not going to, you know, put so much in, in everyone's face to the point where people are confused and asking for switching gears, but I'll put it out there enough to where they're associated with the, with the other athletes that are already on board. So I'll bring them to events, I'll bring them to training, I'll bring them and make them not only feel included, but I'll also have them start, you know, you know, kind of like working with these other athletes in, in, in you know, in posts or different things to show that there's a definite, you know, association. Linkage. It's, it's, it's always, you know, it's funny, because I was doing the same thing in shooting. I was bringing in these bodybuilders, you know, guys like Branch Warren, other people, into shooting, but it was always there. They were always passionate about it. They were hunters, they were outdoorsmen. They were doing all these things. Like, you know, a lot of people didn't realize the love they had for that sport, maybe behind the scenes, yeah. but they were successful at the particular sport that they were passionate about. And I would explain to people, and I would sit in these boardrooms a lot like you, and they'd be like, well, what are we doing here? Why are we having bodybuilders uh, come into shooting? And I said, they were always there. Yeah, yeah, not, not only, only are they always there, but they all, but, but so, so the people that follow them, they are, there's a huge demographic of people that not only follow them, but they are also there too. Mm -hmm. And they're also spending money. And they're also, you know, they're, they're, they may be fitting in what you think is a whole other demographic, but realistically, you know, you could get to them faster, you could get to them more effectively, and you could also, you know, like, you could start, you know, infiltrating multiple categories and industries by just having a couple people included and showing that you're, you know, that you actually support and you have some um, admiration for what these other guys do. And that's the key, is that if you can link those together and you can do it in a way that it doesn't look contrived, it doesn't look like you're so sitting, forced. Yeah, you're not like all of a sudden, you know, like, you know, you, you know like, you, you're, you're not going out and like, throwing Tiger Woods on the team and, and saying, oh yeah, he's, he's, he's this new advocate of ours, and you know, you've know you never seen him do anything within this realm ever, and, and the people that, that are associated with him wouldn't actually be the same people that you would want to be associated with your, with your brand, because they just don't do anything. I'm not saying that it couldn't work, I'm just saying that's, much harder, that's a harder play, you know, than, than having people that you know that are in a different industry, that have done different things, but have you know you being a, a marketer understand that they actually have interest and they have always had interest in the products you produce yeah i think the big i think the biggest thing in it and i don't you know want this to turn into a tedx marketing <laughs> yeah. deal yeah. but i think people do want to know i think they want to kind of understand the insights because you have a lot going on i mean people yeah. see flex they see tony yeah. you know they see quentin they see all that stuff out there that you're doing, especially with CBDMD sure. and all that stuff. So it, it's 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 important to talk about. But I think the linkage is there, and I think people are starting to see it. You still have the 50, 60 something old timers that they have a hard time grasping. But the way I explain it to them, I say, do you think Coca-Cola wants the money from just Coca-Cola drinkers, or do they want it from everybody? Well, let me show you all the brands that you know. It's yeah. it's creating, it's explaining that linkage. Well, I mean, things are cyclical, and we all know this: is that that we go through 
every t- you know every 30 40 50 whatever how many years there's going to be some major changes and, and so you know before the digital the digital social media marketing age was heavily print and commercial advertisements on you know terrestrial tv so the people that were controlling the ad budgets at that point in time from you know from the 70s to the uh, i would say early 2000s it was very hard for them to embrace how how marketing has changed because they don't look at it as real marketing and they definitely 100 percent don't look at it as as, a, as professional marketing so that's always a challenge and it's been a challenge for me for for numerous reasons because you know if if you told somebody from that age demographic that has, has only done things that way that like there are people on youtube right now like and if you, you say yeah this person is a youtube star they'll look at it and go like what is a youtube star mm-hmm. like what is what does that even I, mean i sat in a meeting just the other day and i said if you think we're ahead we're not there is a kid opening presents on youtube right now oh yeah eight million dollars a year yeah yeah. Opening presents. My kid watches that kid. And and so I, I couldn't believe it, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. He's, he, he opens presents, and he opens packages, and he has a ton of companies that send him stuff because of this, because they understand his, the visibility that he gets just from the people that he's, he's uh, you know, he's, he's got his subscription base to. But so, you know, from a you know from a classical standpoint like it, would somebody that had never done that had always had an ad budget and you know in whatever publication go yeah we're gonna we'll, we'll dedicate twenty thousand dollars and start utilizing people like this absolutely not because they look at that like why would we, who is this doesn't make any sense it makes no sense i had you know i mean in in the in the final days of our footwear business you know we had the business for a very long time and, and the actual thing that ended up the, the demise of the brand was the separation between what and where marketing would go. And, and one of the last things that was a huge component and issue that, that um, I was dealing with is I had a, a, um, I had a you know, a former, former um, he was a partner <laughs> of the brand that basically told me, and I'm saying this verbatim, that I didn't know anything about social media, that I was doing it wrong, and that it needed to be done in a different way, and that, you know, that I should spend more time, you know, writing out very long stories on social media and oh. less about doing, you know, doing quick clips and, and and the photos that I was doing. I mean, you're you're talking about a guy that is from a different world. I mean, he was he, at one point in time he was a very successful pro skateboarder, but he was not in any way understanding how this part worked. Yeah. He wanted like the Jay Beatham in catalog. Well, he just he just thought that you know like if, if I you know if I put up a, t- a picture of a shoe right I should have you know like I should flood that shoe with ten different photos within one post right and and not like when I say like a carousel but like just like multiple like like you would do in in an old in an old print ad like you'd be like ten photos on one I mean like so so you know completely just um, cluttered that that it would work in a a. 80s catalog that went out with CCS, you know, years ago or whatever. But now that doesn't work for us. And, you know, there's absolutely no retention when it comes to people reading. So if you think that like there's that you're going to get some, you know, like a kid between any the, the age of, you know, 12 to 18 to read 14 paragraphs on a shoe on, on descriptions and feature, features and functions, it's just not going to happen. Oh, hell no. And so we had we had a we had a you know it was it was a it was a continuous battle of how he believed social media should go and how I know it was supposed to go mm. and hence that's the difference is that you know like you could see it not only I mean our personal social medias became the ones at play and obviously I smoke them on my personal I, smoke on social media. I think it's more important to, to you know and I think what you're getting at is is where it's going and mm-hmm. that's what I spend a lot of time you know I say look this is where it's going. And I use comparisons like Blockbuster Video having an opportunity to buy Netflix at one point sure. and turning it down. And in turning it down, that CEO went down as one of the biggest buffoons in all of any industry. The biggest missed opportunity. Netflix came to him hat Yeah, but hand. could you blame him? See, this is the thing. Can, can you really blame a person that actually, you know, like, I, I, I do believe this, is that, is that I think that, like, from a business perspective, yes, you need to be able to trust 
and and go off of of what your professionals that you hire are saying. But you know, again, when when it gets transitional to the point when this guy, you know, he took the gamble and said no, right? But he just obviously wasn't thinking because he was outside of that realm of what streaming was. Could I could I blame him as a good question? The answer I say is yes, and I'll tell you why. I know hindsight's twenty twenty, but I say this. If you're waiting for things to happen, it's too late. And I think what he was betting on was inferior technology lasting. What he should have, as a CEO, what he should have had the foresight to see is, like you said, all things are cyclical and they change. Hardware changes. Q knows that better than anybody producing the show. Hardware changes all the time. And if he was betting on DVD players or even v if he should have seen that VHS has died, CDs were going to die. The next evolution was going to be streaming in some capacity and at the very least made at least a minimal bet in that space and not making any bet in that space doomed not only his company but all the employees that relied on a paycheck from that company yeah but i mean again i, I mean the, <laughs> the hard part about business and the hard part that's always going to remain is that and, and I, I don't and have no idea who upper management at Blockbuster was. I don't know who the board was. I don't know who, who was overseeing the decisions that were being made on how and what to do and, and why, you know, they look at it like, I mean, I'm certain, I mean, and, and think of it from this perspective, is that they more than likely had so much money invested in the production of, you know, VHS tapes, the production of everything in between to make, the product that they had for standalone brick and mortar stores. So now, you know, you're going to have you're going to have some upper executives going, "Well, look, we're going to we're going to end up losing a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of jobs lost. We're going to be shutting this down. We're going to be doing this." Full well not realizing and knowing that was going to happen no matter what. Mm. You know, so so that president, you know, is is now faced with with this uncomfortable decision of saying, "Do I bet on streaming and, you know, potentially boot out a lot of people that have worked with us for years because that's another thing is that I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen at numerous companies that I've been a part of where you get guys that are, you know, they started a brand when they're whatever in their in their, you know, mid thirties. They start, you know, they 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 they're there there's some tenure behind them. Now now they're they're in mid fifties. Now they're in their sixties. They're still at the brand and they're in high ranking positions. And those guys are now becoming obsolete because not only do they have workforces below them that are completely understanding where other things are going, but you know they're just not doing the work anymore. So they don't want to believe that there's these new things that are happening. So they're going to keep it as stat. They're going to keep it on that train as long as they can until they either retire or until ultimately they get fired and i could i could easily say that just seeing this in my industry and seeing the industry that that i in multiple industries i've been a part of that's a huge issue and that's where things lie is that you get a lot of people that are in these upper you know upper management they positions tunnel vision. well they just they just don't want to affect others in that same spot so they're willing they're willing to not only just slow play things but they're not thinking about how they should be aggressively changing up their model fast so that they could be competing with brands or new brands that are coming up you yeah, know i think the hard part is it, no one could have predicted that boom into streaming and handheld devices i mean the iphone changed the whole game but do you but really though i mean think about it i mean i'm certain you had limewire at one point in time mm -hmm. and you know like for me it's like when i was when i mean like i, I got very the the moment I figured out how how data was going to be transferred, you know, through a telephone wire when in the nineties, how how I saw data transferred through then and I had I had my initial email account set up and then I went on America Online, all these different systems that allow data to be systematically put in front of me at a rate that would be far superior than me trying to get a catalog through the mail. There was a point where now, especially today, that we know that things are still rapidly moving at a at a rate that, in about a year, we're going to be sitting here talking about something else. Going, dude, did you see what's coming out next? You know, and it's not going to be that surprising. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just predict. I've, I've said it before in media, and you know that we're going to eventually. You'll have a TV, as we know it today, 
but eventually marketing will lead to you'll get like a ping on your watch there'll be a commercial playing and it'll say do you want to buy this now or a ping on your phone yeah but it kind of, that's pretty much it you right now it i mean now, like yeah. i mean think about it i mean like amazon gives you alerts any single time you, you I could I could be thinking <laughs> I mean like I could think about something and I could I barely swear. Google it or barely put it in into any kind of search engine and next thing you know it's the algorithm has been picked up and it's already certain like certainly like sending me different things that like could potentially be something that I want to buy. Q had that happen the other day. There were you know some you know those pet websites where the men take off their clothes popped up on his, his computer. Uh, then he got flooded. Then he's <laughs> never gonna stop. Right? Uh, I, don't I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He thinks there's <laughs> alien technology in there. Speaking of the no, aliens, no, because there is. The aliens, because there is. I'm glad you just said that. Speaking of the of aliens, of course there is. We shit. have to get to this. Uh, yeah. I was banned. Oh, I want to talk about this. Yes. I was banned from from. I wanted to post a video that was sent to me by by Tony of you. I was told not to. Uh, of me? I was, I was sequestered. Oh. Uh, uh, and I want to get into this because Jay was, <laughs> Jay was on here and he had some points. And we still, Color? Yeah, we still have the, the alien uh, Area 51 raid fast approaching everybody. Oh, well, that's just a And I want to know where Hans sits on this. Well, I mean, the raid is, I mean, come on. Like, look, I mean, I'm looking at a guy right now in front of me with a, a weapon that will pretty much take that raid out in two seconds if they decided to go anywhere around there. So I we're don't think, ready to go. You know, I, I think that the raid, you know, is uh, is gonna probably not gonna work out in anyone's favor. <laughs> just Our, because, because think about how long they've kept people out of there and and what they've done in that place for so many years. Well, we've researched it deeply, and it's like 15 miles from the fence. So I don't know <laughs> who's making that fucking walk. You know, well, in the I desert. Mean, look, the real, the real, realistically is, is who's going to get down to the underground railroads? That's where you're going to find what you really want to find. Now, you want to get into those networks to the, the underground railroads down there. That's that's where everything is located. Here's the million dollar question: Are there aliens there? Absolutely. Uh, well, I don't know if there's. I don't know if aliens are actually there still. That would that would be a little too easy if you ask me. But I think that what is there and i believe is that there is definite technology that has either been shared or they're working on um to figure out how to communicate better or they are communicating currently with them but you got you got to look at it from like we would be a very you have to be so arrogant as a species to believe that we're the only species like this out there out of this uh, multiple universes and you know in all these different galaxies one there's just one, and because because you know I'm not trying to. You're giving me this weird look that I'm actually like trying I'm to absorbing this. So think of it like this: look, look. I mean, realistically, through the years, I mean, humans have been around for many, 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 many years, and I'm not going to try to make this a theological debate in any way possible. But I will say this: is that look, we have iPhones, like you said, right? And we have we have the technology now to do certain things that like. 10 years ago, we, were like, we would never have dreamed of. 50 years ago, they were only in comic books. 100 years ago, I mean, that's Jules Verne. Like, that was just like a couple people thinking that there could potentially, potentially, you know, be some, some sort of technology that would change the scope of, of how humans interacted in the world was. Now, Weirdly, you know, in the last 80 years, things have dramatically increased and technology is jumping at a rate that's just astronomical. How can that happen? How can that just happen? How can new metals be formed and how can, how can you know, I, like different forms of communication and, and the Internet <laughs> just miraculously appear, you know, in, in a, a very short amount of time when you had civilizations and, and you know, different you know levels of of the human race existing for so long and then within the last hundred years we've got iphones that can play movies and you know basically tell us anything we want to know at any time it's it's just not it's just i'm telling you that it's just we would be very arrogant as humans to believe that there's just us Anytime this topic comes up, it's crazy. My phone starts blowing up. People start asking me questions to ask you, and, and, and everybody starts going crazy. For some reason, this hits a nerve with people, and people do get passionate about it, almost theological about it. Now, my thing is this. I tell everybody this, and I'm on the record saying this. I have no doubts that there's alien technology on this planet. You look at the advancements the last 100 years or so, 
and you have to acknowledge it. There's no question. There's no way we go from a telephone or tapping something and sending Morse code across the universe to where we are today in 100 years, like that, after 5,000 years of dust. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th I, think, I think World War II did some, some serious advancements to it, but I also think that World War II did some serious discoveries in, in figuring out how, you know, either, either where aliens may have been or how to communicate with them or, you know, what technology was, was somehow left and figured out how to be utilized at this point. But, I mean, there is just a major, major shift in technology, you know, that, that has happened in the last hundred years. I mean, too much of a shift, like way too much of a shift. That, that just, it's just like, it's, it's, it's going at, at such a, a rate that like, you know, I don't think that any humans could believe that this is happening. I mean, now when you tell people like, oh yeah, you know, I think in about a year, you know, realistically, you know, there'll probably be a couple flying cars here and there. Like y you can say that now and go, oh, oh yeah, maybe there is, you know, and and we know that the we know the technology is there, but it's to say that these are the things that are going to happen, is 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 it? And then to see that there's still such a heavily guarded, you know, area that that you know the government still is being very nebulous about and won't like really just you know like just come out and go, no, this is what it is. It's so highly secretive still, and there's still so many things that are are locked up inside of there that nobody you know, is either allowed to talk about or just obviously won't talk about it. Do you think they walk amongst us? Oh, man. That's some rowdy, rowdy Piper shit right there, man. They live. You know, uh, there could be. There could be. There could have been some interbreeding uh, with some aliens at some point in time, and there could be definite alien uh, DNA that, that has, has, you know, become something that that is now part of you know a a new evolved human race but i mean look look at humans in general though humans have changed dramatically you know i mean obviously obviously with with uh not only technology but, but the transportation and how how people have you know started to mix with other cultures and mix with different um i mean i'm a product of it myself you know i mean like it's it's who would have thought like i'm i'm you know European and Polynesian, like that's that's a mix that you wouldn't have heard of like 200 years ago, you know, not not as common as it is now. It's a Cali thing, you know. It's <laughs> 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 but but it's it's uh, it's it's just it's just there, man. I mean, it's crazy uh, when you get into this stuff because it causes such a, a reaction, even a visceral reaction from people. Because people are so passionate about it, and I know what in a negative way or in a positive way. Like what? Because I, I, I don't know if you're, what you're seeing. I think over you there. get a little bit of both. Um, Which I think some people are passionate that there's no way, there's just no way they get fired up because they prescribe to the brick and mortar approach. You know, um, yeah, and social media doesn't exist either. And exactly. So I I'm a little bit of both. I don't think aliens walk amongst us, and I'll say why. Okay, I don't think that they do for the simple fact that if they did, I, I think they've landed here. I think technology has been brought here. I think we have access to technology, whether it's via a crash, whether it's via them visiting and communicating. But I believe that they either went back or they're kept underground. They don't necessarily walk amongst us and work amongst us. But I think so much has been downloaded, if you will, that we have used that to have not only technological advancements, but intellectual ones as well. And I think that there are certain people that just operate on a more uh, advanced plane mentally, and they're able to absorb that information and process it in a way that I never could. Uh, I, I just, that's how I feel. Uh, I don't know what they look like. I'm not sure. Um, where they're keeping them. I'm not sure if it's Area 51 or what's involved with that. But I do believe that there's definitely been alien technology on this planet. Now, how that plays into us politically, how that affects any systemic risk involved, everything else in between, I don't know. But it's an interesting topic and it goes in a hundred directions. Um, you know, as far as 
aliens being able to come here whenever they please. I don't know what type of defense capabilities have been brought on by our government, what's been done, how that 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 intrigues me. Yeah, but do you think why I mean why would we have to have defense capabilities unless we th- saw them as a complete threat? I think there has to be some type of screening. I don't I, mean, I don't want to get all men in black, but there's going to be some type of screening involved with that. There has to be some type of uh, understanding, okay, if you come here, you you can't go and get a sandwich at the local sub. I just don't think, I don't think, I think that, the, that there's a big mix, misconception on, on what they are and who they look, what they look like or how long. I mean, I really do believe that there could have been, they could have been here for all, like a lot, 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 lot longer than most people think. And there could have been, like I said, there's, there, I mean, there's so many different ways that people could evolve and things could happen. And... You know, again, I don't know, I don't know what they're doing there that they would need to guard it that hard. You know, I mean, as far as like, you know, I mean, you're you're in the you're in the business of building weapons. I mean, like, think about this for a second. You know, like, what would be there that it has to be so secret that we that there's all these other conspiracies around it, considering the fact that it's just down the street. So we'll have to go to the raid. Q. Put us down. We're going. Oh, I'm not going to the raid. <laughs> he said, I'm no. not going to the raid. No, I'm not, I'm not going to the raid. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to, that's the thing is, I'm going to watch it from my smartphone and I'm going to watch everybody else get go there and then just, just, just shot the hill. Yeah. 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 You think they'll yeah. shoot him, Q? Yes. Hell yeah. Yes. Yes. I do. They're going to kill him dead. <laughs> yeah, they'll shoot a couple of them, and then everybody else will be like, oh, fuck this. this isn't, I ain't going well, to we'll have to, we'll, we'll get some Popeyes and we'll watch. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't see. I don't. I don't. I, actually, I, I think that everyone would just stand there and not do anything because that, that one person that, that takes that first leap, they get smoked. They be like, yeah, I don't. I guess I just don't feel like I want to go in there anymore. Because what do you? Because what are you gonna do? You're gonna run around there and just get in there, and then all of a sudden, where are you gonna go? You're just gonna run up to it. <laughs> You're going to run up under the base? Like, okay, we're here, guys. Where do we go now? The whole idea is we haven't thought that far ahead. Yes. Our brain isn't there yet. But I think we I think we can at least make it to the gate. Well, I think that the people's brains that are there are already on the base. That's deep. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, why, why not? I mean, like, if you really want... They, look at it. If you really wanted to figure out, if you had... I mean, we've known about Area 51 long enough, and, and as... As uh, growing up, you're like, you know what? My, my desire is to figure out what's on air. You just you just figure out how to do it. You go into the you, you would you would figure out how and what job it would take to get to be a part of Area 51, and you would go and do it. And then once you did it, you'd be like, ah, uh, all right. Supposedly well. they recruit you. Supposedly you got to get like recruited. So maybe, you know, I think you got to be a certain kind of in a certain field. Maybe I have to. But yeah, but you know what field you need to be in. I mean, like thermonuclear. They're not just recruiting some some randoms that definitely don't want to go to Area Fifty One. That's true. The joke's on all of us I, right I, now. I think so. I think we gotta. I think we gotta do a little more research. We have to go a little deeper. You know, um, this is this is deep. Do you want to? Do you want to comment on the Kennedy assassination? Oh, you want to go there now? Yeah, let's. Let's these are his favorite topics. Are, huh? Yeah, no, I'll the go. The Kennedy assassination is passionate to me. I'm a New Englander, so this is a big deal to me, being from Boston. So it's a big deal because you like are are you because of the family or yeah, it's a my, big deal? well, my my family. I grew up uh, as a byproduct. My my parents were byproducts of the Kennedy generation. So the that that whole baby boomer generation identified very closely with the Kennedy family. And being from New England and vacationing in Hyannis. The Kennedy family was always at the forefront, so it was always talked about. You read every book, you heard every lore, um, similar to to what you know um, would be considered conspiracy theory. It was household conversation. Um, was he killed by one gunman? No. Was it the mafia? Potentially. I think it, I think I think it was a combination of people. I think that I think that it was moving. I think the government and I think that he was moving in a direction that, at that point in time, scared a lot of people. Well, look, he was moving in a direction. His administration was moving in a direction. We were, there was a lot of stuff escalating all over the place, 
and um, there was there was some major movements that were starting up there were, that that were firing up in ways that he was going to fast track a lot of stuff quick, and you know I think because of that certain time period, it's different than it is now. There's a lot more stuff that you could do now from a from a cyber perspective t- that you don't need to assassinate somebody, mm-hmm. you know, at all. I mean, actually, and and but then you didn't have those you didn't have the same outlets now. You know, you could you could you could completely just assassinate somebody online and get rid of them. And basically, it's almost worse because they're still around. They're still around yet. They can't, uh, you know, like they're they're completely damaged because of what's been done to them online. But with with then at that period of time, like when people were getting smoked back then, it's just easier just to get rid of them. So that's just done. I, I think he was such a young president and he was the youngest at the time he represented such young ideals and such change like you said he represented so much change coming i mean he had done so much in a short period of time and it scared a lot of people what he represented was just what we talked about earlier a lot of those old timers those 50 60 70 somethings he represented a huge change a sweeping change well he was also one of the first to start the political i mean like look before us you know the southern democrats were completely different they're different people right mm-hmm. and so as as he you know came in, into um you know into power and he became you know the president he shifted that that party majorly that that party started to shift and change in different ways that a lot of people didn't like and that right there is a, is enough to to piss off and not only you know it, it was it was riling up i mean like he was he was going against his own party on a lot of different well things. he represented the birth of the limousine liberal and a lot of people don't understand um there's a big difference between lieberman liberals and and kennedy liberals and it was just a total shift in in political thinking um you know people you know it, people don't understand you have Democrats now, like Hillary Clinton, that went out there and they say, I understand what it's like to be poor. Well, Hillary Clinton probably doesn't know what a gallon of milk cost if you held a, held a gun to her head. She probably has no idea what, what a gallon of milk cost. And that's a disconnect that happens. But Democrats want to be un- understood as the party of somebody's without. And they don't get that. They really don't understand. No. At all. Um, but it's but it's their target demo. I mean, right. from a marketing from a marketing standpoint, that's what they do for one reason is because they understand that a that's who's gonna that's where they're gonna be able to you know, that's where they're gonna pull their money for 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 their campaigns. That's who they're gonna they're gonna aim well, at. Well, that's to, why to she goes votes. on an all black radio show and they ask her what her favorite thing she carries is and she says, "What you hot sauce?" Uh, yeah, like Beyonce. Like, do we really believe Hillary Clinton's favorite thing she carries around is hot sauce? No. I mean, let's be honest here. It's it's one of those things. It's it's old politics trying to play to that old bedrock. And then people like Candace Owens come along and, and of course, Kanye, and they start breaking those walls down and they start saying, well, are these white liberals really representing us that are riding around in limos? And Mercedes Benz, do they really understand what's going on in that community? And we talked about this, Q, even on, on Suresh's podcast. We got into this. It, it's, it's a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation. Um, you know, I think Kennedy was, was such a powerful force that I think you're right. I think there was multiple forces in play. He, he, he was, but he was also connected with a lot of people that, that were not traditionally connected in the political realm. You know, I mean, obviously, there's, there's, there's everything from Marilyn to, to the mafia to... Him buying the election. Yeah, there's just, I mean, there's so many facets to his presidency, his, the short amount of time that he was there, that was really starting to shift the paradigm of what politics was going to become and it was easier i mean like and it became easier having like an lbj in rather than having kennedy because things just would have been different well it was that it's what they called the the reason that it it, yeah you're absolutely right but the reason it triggered that way is it was always called the boston austin connection Mm -hmm. you had to have somebody from that new england new york cut up and you had to have a bible belt guy with them sure and that was the way boom the marriage happened and you got all the votes that way. I mean, to Han's point, like there's a whole 
segment of belief that you know it could have been a white nationalist kind of deal because Kennedy was like like Hans was saying he was ready to fast track a lot of race relation type shit. You think that, Ken? I I don't know. Just another uh, layer you know, of the I, onion. I, I but, think I think you know. that I think that I think that he realized the the power that he had to really get things going quick and they were moving fast faster than faster than politics had ever moved at that point in time and there was in the one remember the one thing that the, the biggest play that that had not been as much of an issue at all prior to, to Kennedy is the television and so as we have social media now I mean look I mean it, it, perfect another good example is how well you know, you've got you've got you know people utilizing Twitter and social media, and they can get the message out quick, and they know how to speak to the people right. And so that's what Kennedy was doing. He had TV, and that's how he that's how he beat you know Nixon. Nixon, he 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 killed him, you know, because he was a he, he for the first time you saw a guy on TV that that could play it up, and he did play it up, and. You know, you had you had a younger demographic. You had a lot more people that were ready to change up a little bit, and they had they had the power to vote, and they did, and they got him in. And I think as he was moving in in a progressive direction, that was definitely going to affect a lot of businesses, a lot of people, a lot of just change in uh, in America. That was a lot. That was a lot to be dealing with at that time, and there was no internet, and there was no way. There was just like he wasn't going to get impeached anytime soon. That wasn't going to happen. And, and he was probably, you know, one of the other things people discount. He was probably one of the wealthiest families presidents that we had seen, and in, in probably since Hoover, right, Dave? Probably. So he wasn't beholden to money as much. Dave's like, just stop yelling random shit out at me, man. Right. I mean, probably since Hoover, right, Dave? Probably one of the wealthier families. Franklin was pretty. The Fra the Franklin family is pretty wealthy. FDR was was wealthy, but he wasn't like Hoover Kennedy wealthy, right? Right. Right. No. Yeah, Hoover was probably so. Probably in fifty years, we hadn't had a guy in office that like he was just like, I don't need your fucking money. No, he didn't need it. And his and his the the, the family dynasty that he, that he was a part of. Uh, okay, and that and that, that breaks into a whole other. That's know, a whole other. You know, is, worms, it, is that but. is that the dynasty is 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 something that they wanted to? I mean, they're moving it quick. They the Kennedys were moving quick down that route with multiple Kennedys coming into different you know different places to start taking over government, which you know obviously would change would dramatically change the course of everything that was happening at that time, mm -hmm. and it was going quick. I mean, you went from you know you went from a from a an Eisenhower generation to the Kennedy generation, which was a huge shift. It, it raises another crazy question I'm going to throw at you at being a marketing guy. Was was the Kennedy election the birth of modern marketing? 100%. Or was it, uh, yeah. Yep. I wouldn't. I would, I, I, yep. You know, I, yep. I say crazy stuff. Like, like, I look at the Coke versus Pepsi, yep. you know, deal. I, I look yep. at that a lot. Uh -huh. and, I, and that always intrigues me because I love Coke's marketing. And, you know, it's, it's something we all come back to as kind of the the birth of marketing in our generation, but the Kennedy election for sure. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, Ken the, the Kennedy election utilized him as a icon, as a face. They put him everywhere. I mean, like he became he, he, the the you, you. They moved away, and he didn't need to have you know this dramatic military figure that they had prior to Kennedy, right? Eisenhower, so yep. yeah. So so they had somebody that was younger. They had somebody that was good looking. They had somebody that was there that like could represent the country in a way that was. Very progressive, and they, Kennedy became a brand. The name Kennedy Kennedy was a hundred percent. It still is a brand. Well, it was undefeated you know? in Massachusetts for I think it might even be still undefeated in Massachusetts and on Massachusetts soil. I don't think a Kennedy has ever lost. I think that's still Q. Look that up. I think that's still true. Has a Kennedy ever lost in Massachusetts? I think Probably that still not. holds weight. I, they may have lost one, but it, it, it's it's still. I think. Was it Patrick or somebody lost? But I think that was in Rhode Island. I think for a long time it was New England, but I think not a Kennedy's lost on Massachusetts. Soil. I mean, I mean, you know, so so after after um, Kennedy, you know, put together what he did, you saw how different Richard Nixon came back around, and when he when he put his his campaign together, you know, f when he ran and actually won, you know, it was a different, it was a stark change. You know, and then from that moving forward, that's when all these gigantic, 
you know, um, you know, like these these campaigns became mega campaigns. Being being such a student of history as you are, as I can tell, um, we got into this, you know, on the phone, even chatting. Does it shock you how far extreme sports has come since you've been involved? Does it surprise you at all where the UFC is and and understanding that growth spurt and and seeing how much that's changed and how it's accepted it is now? No, not at all. No, because I mean, you got to look at. I mean, I look at sports and and again, you know, from from just the last hundred years and seeing how how they've gone. It's just basically this. I mean, humans are going to be the same no matter what. They want to see people doing things that could potentially kill them. <laughs> yeah, I and think it, I, I think the steroid era in baseball changed everything. Yeah, I'm a big believer that in '98 yeah. when there was the chase for the home runs, I think a lot of the walls got broken down, the goody goody walls, and people just wanted to see gladiators. Well, it, it's just, it's. I mean, anything you do nowadays, I mean, you know, from your marketer, you understand this, is that you're doing it for effect. And so when when you see, I mean, it's it's very simple to understand that, like, fighters are always going to be, you know, a spectacle that people are going to want to watch. I mean, it's it's just... The old saying, Dana said it best years ago. You know, you could have a guy, you could have, you could have, you know, a basketball game going on in one corner. You could have, you know, people playing baseball in the other corner. You could have, you know, some track and field going on, you know, on the other corner. But a fight breaks out in the other corner, everyone's running to the fight. Every single person that's from great, every yeah, single place. That's a great point. And everyone wants to see it because, you know, you're you're dealing with, you're dealing with, you know, an old school, tr- you know, just a. Uh, it's what everyone want. Like they want to see who's going to win. You know, they're going. They want to go and they want to. The the, the 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 you know combat is always something that we've got ingrained in us. You know, we want to see. We want to see the the two people go for it hard. I mean, to the point where there's going to be some drama involved and potentially somebody get really, really, really injured, and that's why they're watching. You know, and, and that's the thing with it. You know, you, you track back to extreme sports, it's the same thing. Like, you're not going to be, wa- I mean, it, it, any, you know, it, when, and when you do talk about extreme sports and you talk about like skateboarding, people want to see them doing majorly big things that they could break their legs in half or they could, you know, get hurt. And if that's what, if that's what they're doing, that's what's going to be, what's going to, you know, track the best and, and people are going to pay attention to. Does it surprise you when companies get a little bit away from, what got them to the dance like you see you know monster embedded in in the ufc and in fight world does it surprise you like recently you know dave just wrote an article nascar is stepping away a little bit from guns Uh does that does that shock you the the kind of evolution of sports moving away from kind of i always say you dance with the girl you took to the prom Mm -hmm. does it surprise you when they start to move away from certain segments at all well so if if you want you want to like I mean if you're if you're using the the NASCAR gun um like I guess comparison I mm-hmm. I mean I don't know I mean I I I just think that brands evolve and when I say brands sports and the brand I think all 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 evolve um I, I don't know generally speaking where their consumer is going and I'm not gonna say that. Look, who knows? I mean, maybe maybe they have like maybe there's somebody there that that has has figured out something that that we just don't know, right? And that they've got this they've seen the older consumer either dying or going away and this new consumer is coming through and and just through whatever, mm. you know, whatever research they figured out that this is where they need to go. Do I think it's right? I'm not certain because I don't work for those companies, but the companies that I do work for, I could tell you that we have you know, we've dabbled in certain things that were completely out of the realm of what they used to be, and they failed sometimes. You know, I mean, you're, there, there's probably a bigger failure rate than there is a home run rate, but it also comes down to who's running the program. Never as big as New Coke, though. No. Mm. Yeah. So, Q, has, Kennedy, has a Kennedy lost the mass? You figure that out? You cracked that code yet? I'm curious. Why you didn't like New yeah, Coke? Yeah, me and uh, me and Dave were me and Doctor Dave were trying to figure it out. It's it's a little hard to nail down the, the specifics, but it's looking like it. That's a no. It looks like you're right, but it's hard to nail it yeah, down. Yeah, I don't to, like, believe a Kennedy's ever Brown. lost it. So you that that might be it. one of the better brands ever created is the Kennedy brand on New England soil. Yeah, I think one lost in Rhode Island. I think it was Patrick Dave. If, if you do know my daughter's name, Kennedy. Yeah, like. 
that's she's, how so she's it, named after rich that's how deep white it goes, bootleggers. Man. Hey man, that's that's, that's Irish what I, I, I love it, man. Well, that and the um, you the know the, the, the royal family is a, a phenomenal family brand. You know, yeah. I mean that's that's one that's that's that stand the test of time forever. In fact, do you know their last name? I do, and it, it, I don't know it now off the top of my head. I, I've read it. Uh, it escapes me. Damn it. I saw it on a History Channel show. Yeah, like I, 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 it's passed by me. Damn it. Oh. I don't know it. I'm, I'm always curious to figure out if somebody knows you it. I got to go to the because, Google. Because it's, it's, the it's, Google. It's, 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 I know it's Prince Charles of Windsor, and it's you know all these yeah, different they things. Yeah, get, they but, get... But is, but they, is there what is their real last name? They get like a fake title. Am I right in saying that, Dave? It's like it's it's like a. But what would be on their driver's wait, license wait, or their passport? Wait, Hans, are you talking about the Kennedy right? family? No, no I'm talking no, about the actual family. I'm talking family. about the uh, the, the oh, okay. Queen of England. Cause the Kennedy, cause that's not even their real. Like they get uh, like, name. Like, they get like the the Earl of Windsor, but they don't really own Windsor. It's an old um, Windsor. Yeah, no. Yeah, but but it's it is weird because I've I've tried to figure it out for so many years and I still can't figure out what their last. I don't know what Charles Prince Charles's last name is. It's probably like. Um, I don't think they have them. I really don't. They're like Madonna. Queen kind of. Elizabeth and the royal family have no last name. They don't, do they? Are you serious? No. I'm looking at Yeah. They, they They're do aliens. not have. There you go. They Why do don't not... they have a last name? They're alien. <laughs> They're alien. So, you know, I we, we have to ask you this because it's been all the buzz in this office. We've been talking about it like crazy, and we're going to get to other stuff, but this, this is important. Are you shocked at all by what I think is the most viral thing the last five years, the Popeye's chicken sandwich? No. Does that get you excited? No. Are have you, you had a Popeye's chicken <laughs> sandwich? Are you interested at all? Have you tasted one? You know, no. We have one down I, the road we've been filming. No, I have never had one, and, and honestly, I, I, I am, I'm sorry. Well, they added pickles. Oh, that's disgusting. Do, <laughs> It's been the most viral, ridiculous thing ever to the point where other companies like Chick-fil-A are benefiting from it. And it blows my mind because, like, literally Chick-fil-A... Have you had it? No, we can't get it. It's sold out. I thought Q would have the inside track. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? <laughs> I thought Q would have the inside track to Popeye's chicken. I, will, I need the inside track. I need I, I need thought you'd know someone lines. on the inside. You, you fucked us. I need it. The... the the biggest thing that blew my mind was when Chick Fil A came out and said, "You know, keep fucking around, and we'll open on Sundays." That that was like, <laughs> well, well, I mean, that's that's one of those things. I'm I mean, like, I come on. I I went to Chick Fil A about a month ago on a Sunday with my son, and it bummed me out. I forgot that they weren't open on yeah. Sundays. I'm like, man, there's nobody here. Wow, look, I drive it closed. I'm like, why can't they just be open on Sundays? Now let me ask you, what what does viral mean to you? Because you've been in this business so long, what is viral? What is, what is your definition of viral? Um, something that gets picked up by multiple. Okay, like obviously it's it it does well in the original stores, right? So the, so the so I put out a video and all of a sudden I'm seeing ten times the amount that I would ever see from anything else I put or or, or post whatever. Then you know it starts to get shared in a way that it's going in multiple directions to multiple people that are are continuously pushing it out. And then it populates onto larger websites that somehow pick it. Because I've had a couple of these happen to me mm. where, where, you know, like, you know, you get these big news sources that now picked up your story because they're seeing it with everybody else. And some large, I mean, usually it's when, you know, it's, it's you know. It's, it becomes bigger than your sphere of influence. The, yeah, the, 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 the um, you know, the, the, the post now somehow winds up on somebody's, like on a major pla major social media platform that that is a celebrity or somebody that has like countless followers that could push it out even more and then you know you know on, at the last end tail of it you know it ends up somehow on terrestrial TV and so that's ironically the last of it that's viral to me is, is terrestrial TV still a thing though no I mean it's there is cable TV dead yet. Um, I think that it's it's not dead, but it's struggling to the point where it's on life support. 
because you don't need to get you don't need to get news from it anymore. You don't. You're. I mean, you could get news from Instagram faster than you could get it from 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 you know any kind of terrestrial network. You're you're like it, you're you're basically going on. T- I don't even go on TV anymore. The only reason why I would go on TV is that I'm gonna if I'm bored and I'm just trying to like find a old movie that I would probably never ever want to rent from Apple you know movies and then it just shows up. Is that one of the main reasons you don't see you know Monster dedicate any any money towards? We don't. We've only done we've only we've done very very few ads and um, one of them was Conor McGregor ad for um, and it was it was f- for the opening season of NASCAR and I uh, actually we filmed it right down the road and that was right when he was fighting um, Mayweather but we got more we got more um, we got way more visibility when I just ha- said, "Hey, Connor, can you just put this up on your social media?" <laughs> you know, and it went. I mean, it was. It was. I mean, it just went everywhere. That's that's where. It, it, I mean, guys like him can make things go viral. He put up a photo him and I before the night before he fought, um, or the day before he fought Khabib. Last time he was out here, mm. he put up a thank you post to me for just whatever for some for a lot of stuff that we. I've been working with him since he was a kid. And that thing, you know, like I hadn't, I mean, it, that went everywhere for me. And that was a post that, in my mind, a man can make something go viral. One guy, and that was Connor. Yeah, he was at the top of his game at that point between Mayweather and, um, you know, the fight with Khabib and just everything he had going on. He was a one man, you know, viral machine. Oh, he's still there. Yeah. He's still there. He, he is still there. But he's at that there. point, he was like fire. Everything he touched. Uh, you, you, Connor's just, Connor's uh, is an enigma. And whenever he's, he's going to be one of those guys that, that. How much of it is an act? Well, it's not an act. Okay, it's a, so it's so, a gimmick. So, so, it's a, no, no, it's no. not a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. And I'll tell you, I'll explain how Connor works and what it's about. Is that Connor is a genuine one hundred percent like he is the person who you think he is. He sees he and his he is a very confident man and he one hundred and ten percent when he says he's gonna do something, he's gonna go and do it. Whether or not it's the result he thinks it's gonna be, he's still gonna go and do it. Every single thing that he's ever said to me about um, you know, from fighting Mayweather to winning multiple world champions to to just doing everything he's done, he he actually has he he said these things to me. He said he was going to do these things, and when I say that it's not an act, is because he really does believe in himself like that. What happens though, and how it comes out, and how it's portrayed, is that it escalates, and he feeds off of anything that's like so. So you know he's getting ready for a fight. The tensions start. Somebody starts on him. He escalates it quick. Right? He knows he needs to sell a fight. He gets that part. So he just pushes it forward. But Connor is Connor. When you're, if Connor walked into the room today, right now, like just walking in to see us, not only would you feel his presence, but he's not. He's not the. He's not. He is with that. He's always the same. He's is, always on. Is he the biggest guy you've worked with? As in far as of following and reach and just scope. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, he. Currently, yes. I mean, I've worked with many large, in, you know, like influence influence people. But I mean, like, I hate to call them an influence. Yeah, because I mean, like, I mean, I would say, I would say the the equivalent to Connor that was very similar, and I had exactly. I mean, I did Rampage, and I were on a very similar level, right? I worked with Rampage when he was he was it was before the UFC. It was before he had any sponsors. I mean, like, it was it was him and I, and and I worked with him, you know. All the way through UFC championships, making through, the leap to movies. Oh yeah, doing the A team, all that stuff. I was with him, and then um, during when Rampage was was there was a, a brief period of time when when he was kind of figuring out what he was going to do. Yeah, the next steps. Well, there's some other stuff that happened, but there was a. <laughs> there's, that's what I'm, not, I'm not going to bring up that part that deep, but I'll just say this: is that that I had a uh, another athlete that was that I was introduced to that I knew about, and I knew I knew that there was potential. Nobody wanted to touch him. Nobody wanted to, to take a take any kind of risk with him, and I jumped on immediately. And that's Kimbo Slice, and I had Kimbo, and Kimbo and Connor are very similar in that manner. Kimbo Kimbo was a guy that that I I had. You know, he completely trusted everything that I, you know, I kind of directed him to do. I produced all of his apparel. 
You know, I shot all the original photos of them. Like, I did everything I could because I felt it. Like, I knew. I've, I get these intuitions with athletes and, and people that I work with, and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling I, – I, I could feel that this, this, this person has – There's something the there. The juice and the drive yeah. to, make them, to make them stand out in a way that's going to push them to the next level. Kimbo was was that person, and, and and I and I you know I worked with him on his first three fights, and we we be I mean I've never seen those many that many t-shirts sell in my entire life ever. Oh, yeah, I'm, sh- I'm you sure. You know, he and was, he was as viral as they get at one. point. Yes, and I mean. and so from there, as Kimbo went, and he ended up step, you know, going his dra- whatever. He might have been the original viral. He was, you know, you know, he was he was the original um, social viral for sure. Because I mean, like all the original fights that were on YouTube were some of the most watched watched videos ever. You know, I mean, he he helped put YouTube on the map in many ways. Yes, I mean, there's no doubt. Is let me ask you this because there's so much shit I want to ask you. It's crazy. Is is Instagram dying and is YouTube taking over? That's an interesting question because I mean, um, I I don't. I think you know there's separate platforms, but you know, and, and I did this recently as an experiment. Um, I did this. I did a, and, and I'm still looking at, at at different ways on how this is going to work. And I don't know how Instagram is going to fix it to make it work better. But I'll just say this: is that Instagram's long format just doesn't work. You know, Instagram TV, IGTV does not work in the way that YouTube does. It doesn't. It can't, and it won't. And I don't know why they can't fix it to make it. A little bit more user friendly, so it so it can have that same effect that YouTube does, but currently it does not. When it comes to quick, you know, instant gratification, Instagram's still king. Like they they haven't been shaken from that yet. But you know, I mean, prior to Instagram, you know, I everybody was in Facebook, and everybody had to had to have you know their their Facebook in in, in in a in a way that was their their daily life, right? And prior to Facebook, there was MySpace, you know, and MySpace was a, the precursor to all of it to to getting us all involved in jumping in this puddle. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things I come back to as I say this, I say I, I've I've had this fight with Tony. Tony and I've had this debate. And I've pushed him a lot more towards YouTube, and he's doing it. Yeah. And and Jay and I talked about this a lot off camera too, because Jay's doing a lot with JTV, and he's focusing yeah. a lot on YouTube. And I and I'm, I've had the same conversation with Flex, and we'll see what Flex does. Yeah. Uh, the reason being is number one, Facebook owns Instagram. Yes. Number two, they sequester and suppress a lot of stuff. A hundred percent. Instagram bets on a bet I'm not willing to take as someone who might potentially be financing, just like you, something. And that bet is how much you're willing to swipe down. Yes. And I don't like that bet. What I like is a search bar. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is the second most used search bar behind Google. And the only person that can compete out there, not just with Facebook, but also with Captain Moneybags over there at Amazon, is Google. And Google controls everything on the Internet. And I'm willing to place that bet. I'm not saying subscribers on YouTube are better than anything on IG, but I'm willing to say a subscriber on YouTube is worth no, more. No, I, I think they are, and I'm going to tell you why. I do believe the subscribers on YouTube are dedicated in a way that they're not just seeing the random shit you're putting out. Um, I think that the subscribers for your for a YouTube channel they're seeking is, you is, out. Is, is is they're they're really there. I mean, it's like it's it's like somebody that's like you know that that wanted HBO in their home package. They want to see what you're doing. Um, they're they're definitely harder to acquire, but they're but the retention on, on what you do is is far superior than what you're going to get in, on Instagram. I think on social media we're marching towards a fight that a lot of people don't see yet fully. And I think that that fight, as cable TV dies, is going to be subscribers versus followers. Um, yes, but the difference is this: is that so? So for me, from a brand perspective, and just you know, from a brand building perspective, you got to look at it two two ways, right? So if you're going to be promoting a product, right, you're going to be promoting a product, or you're just trying to get some like just you know like a very you know, like 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 a quick fix photo out to somebody that like they that, that just gets them excited and interested that will get them to your YouTube. That has to happen because guess what? I mean, people aren't just going to randomly search out your YouTube if they don't know who you are. And the one thing that Instagram has that YouTube doesn't have is that it's easier to like I, I could get to different people. I could I could follow and find different people on Instagram much easier than I can on YouTube. And the thing is, with YouTube, it's more of a dedicated customer. But once you get them, 
you really get them. Mm. And then you could give them the long format they want, and they're going to watch it. Where you're not, where, you, where if you're putting out long format on um, on Instagram TV, on IGTV, it's just not going to be the same effect, and you're not going to get you're not going to get the same result that you would ever get on on um, on YouTube. Yeah, and, no, and, and, and and so another another thing too is is this is and this is this is just from my perspective of what's worked for me, is that anything that I produce on I mean if I if I if I actually go out and this is the, and I tell this because I, I work with a lot of uh you know a lot of directors and producers that like you know and and, and they'll they'll want to work with me and try to film something and this you know this does work for for Tony right because he he produces pieces right mm -hmm. he produces content oh, yeah. for for IG that but he's very disciplined in a way that he's he'll put out his pieces and then you got to wait for the next one a week later or, or like 5 days later or 4 days whatever where I'm different for me it's I'm putting out pieces that like I'm trying, I'm I'm belting them out like two to three a day. So that yeah, you're at, I know where you're going. There's guys who do the here and now, mm -hmm. and I try to do a balance of the here and now, and then there's kind of like the setup pieces. Yeah, and Tony likes to put out there. You know, he'll do some. You can pick out the here and now, and he'll do a lot of like I want to give you insight into this workout or yes. this training, and it's more produced than it is you know organic you could pull and see kind of like what he's done that's real and on the phone and now versus that and there's people that do both there's people that do both successfully and and you know um one's not i don't want to say better yeah it just it's it's it, it, just, it just fits for the person i mean like for like again for me using me as a reference point because i i built i, I mean it took me when when we dissolved, um, well, when we all left Osiris, all of us that were executives at our, at our footwear brand, that we you know we saw that we saw the biggest and most insane demise of a of a successful company like within a matter of months. It was the saddest thing ever. Uh, but I, it also forced me to to push myself and brand myself and build my my online character in, in a hyperdrive because I never want to get stuck in a situation like that again because we had. We had a lot of competitors um, that that came in way later than us. I mean, you know what? It's it, it's similar to is this is that like we had we had the opportunity to just be an online like to to take some of our retailers and just go online with Osiris. We should have done that. We didn't do it. We we're too scared because we thought we were gonna piss off all the brick and mortars that ended mm. up fucking going out of business anyway. Right. We we didn't do it, and so that was the, and then so when we tried to do it later on in the game, it didn't work as well. But. I also was a, um, I, you know, I didn't go and build my brand profile as a marketing slash businessman until a couple, like really last year. And the reason why is that a lot of my peers and the people that that I had, you know, worked with, they're all in their fifties and sixties, and they were they're very against it. They're they're very against. You know, unless personal brand building, personal brand building, but more like, hey, look, if like if if the Wall Street Journal is going to come do a story on you, we'll talk about it. Let's do it. And then let's all do it structurally. So we're putting out the, you know, a very, you know, articulated, well thought out, planned message. Right. Which to me is not what anyone wants to read anyway now. And so none of us. Well, so so a couple of us. Well, the, the two the two younger of us that were, were the executives of this brand, like we missed this opportunity. The older guys didn't even have they didn't even have social media. They didn't believe in it. They thought it sucked and it wasn't going to be around. Whatever. They didn't do it. Um, Brian Reed and I we did do it and we did it hard. But we also turned down opportunities to grow our personal brands that would have put us in a way different category. Yeah, it's crazy because you're yeah. I mean you're you're a little bit older than me. So I I always fought. You know I very early on branded my own name, branded my own name to a lot of things because I, I just, you know, I saw it more as, you know, look, I'm going to put this out there and if people like it, they'll look at it. If they don't, they won't. It's it's not, it wasn't something to me where I felt it conflicted with the existing brands and I think that, that those walls are down, I guess, now. Well, I mean, I've had companies, I've had companies that I've associated and I have actually had, I've done, you know, con I've, I'm, I do work for that were very against me doing anything like that and um, actually utilizing their brand or being a part of it, any of that stuff. Yeah, it's changing. It's rapidly changing right now because I think they also realize that like if they they're going to be they're going to be losing out on, you know, I mean, I have over 100,000 people now that are paying attention to what I'm doing, you know, and so 
There's a benefit. There's a huge benefit, and because because they want to hear and they want to see and they want to be a part of what I'm doing. And if you say so, from a brand perspective, if you go, well, we don't want you, we we don't want you included, including our brand. You could do whatever you want to do on your own. Just don't include anything we're doing. You just missed out on right. all this 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 marketing you could have. You know. Yeah. No, I agree. I think I think there's a balance. I think you just have to work with like-minded people, and you have to be around like-minded peers in whatever company it is you're working with that understand hey look i'm i don't need to filch from the brand but i can support it in a in a different way personally that i think can contribute to the greater good it, it doesn't have to be uh um something that's kept in the closet like oh yeah you know i, I work at goldman sachs but i'm not going to tell anybody because it's no i did though I, I mean i had to go through that and it was it was a it was a difficult thing for me and now you know i just <laughs> You know, I, I mean, it, it kind of pushed and powered me to go. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna build this thing. I'm doing. I'm doing it the way I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. I'm going to be very um, cognizant on the on the content that I put out and the people that you know follow me because I want to retain them. I don't want to be a freak show and then all of a sudden they just split on me, right? I want them to hear my message. I want them to be a part of what I'm doing so that they they move with me and they grow with me and then I've got a dedicated base and following and fan group that normally somebody in my position would never have. It just doesn't make any sense. But now, you know, you've got like you've got got you got mega guys like Gary and you know, I mean, Grant and all these guys that that go out there and they sell marketing and they sell sales through their their social media and that to me is like well okay if they're doing it why wouldn't i do it right you know, you know it makes total sense um we gotta go shoot some guns soon but um i wanna i, I you know so much i gotta get you back in here um so let me ask you this with all that being said what you know what has been kind of one of the you've been through so much and seen so much what has been one of the more exciting, either it's people you've worked with or exciting moments that you kind of like pinch yourself and you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this? Oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, anything Conor related has been like that. Wild. You know, I mean, I mean, like I said, I mean, I shot Conor McGregor on the beach in Los Angeles maybe five years ago, and not one person knew who he was on the beach. Imagine this: Los Angeles on the beach, on the beach. with no one knowing who he is. If I brought Conor McGregor to Los Angeles on the beach right now, there would be riots. You know what I mean? And in, in that point in time, like he didn't have any, it was just him and, his, and, and D. Mm -hmm. and it was just, you know, we're out there and he, he, he's, he actually thought he could drive from, um, from Los Angeles to Miami. He's like, can we just drive there? Isn't it a couple hours? I mean, he was so clueless on all this stuff at that time. Yeah. He had never traveled. He didn't do anything. He was just so, he was such a, and he is. He still is. He's, he was such a, a grateful person in the position he is is in. Yes, Connor makes mis Connor makes mistakes, just like everybody else. I mean, he's like, a, you know, he's he's a he's a kid from Crumlin that got, you know, a a ton of money real fast, and that doesn't change the mindset that he's he's already, you know, it, it built into his head. I mean, he is still that kid, but he's a very good man, and I will never. I mean, I I, I will defend him. You know, like I defend any of my athletes, if you're a part of what I do, and there's if there's a very strong correlation of athletes that have been with me for a very long time, I will defend them and I will keep them around me and I will help them as long as I can. No matter, I don't care if you win, I don't care if you lose. I care about the content of your character and how you can work with me so we could we could together brand build not only them as athletes but the brands that we represent together and that's just it is that that's that to me is is the teamwork that builds these cool companies and these cool teams that makes people want to be a part of it do you, what advice let me ask you this before we kind of get close to wrapping what what advice would you give someone starting out that says geez you know i i, I would love to work with the brands this guy represents because i asked bruce the same thing with quest and you know, he's with quest and blackwater and he said you know, he goes, I would tell them to follow me around. Find me at a show. If you pack your bags and follow me around the show. No, no, don't, don't follow me around. around. <laughs> I don't want you to follow what, me what around. What advice would you give? <laughs> I would say this. is that Look, and I give I give this advice to anybody because I get hit up on a daily basis. People want to either, you know, like they, uh, they want to intern. You know, they want to... I get, you want to get around it. This is what I get every single day. You're so lucky. I wish I had your job. I'm like, okay, well, you don't even know what my job is, first of all. And second, you know, I think that you need to, you have to take a very hard look at what I'm doing and what you want to do. If you just want to be around cool people and cool athletes and go to cool events, 
well, you know what? That's just maybe 5% of what I do. You're only seeing a snippet of it. Yeah. Of your, uh, I, I, too, am a marketer. I'm going to show you the highlights that I want to show you. The truth of the matter is is that, that 95% of the stuff that I have to do in making these things work aren't glamorous, and they're definitely not sexy, and it's not fun to do. Those really late nights, I'm, I'm I mean, like, I've been on the road for six days straight. You know, I'm married. I got two kids, and now it's not easy to be able to maintain a life that like has you traveling and moving around as much. With the advent of social media, it's become even worse because basically, well, not, oh, let me re, let me retract that back. Is that with the advent of technology from the aliens that gave it to us <sighs> back in the '50s, um, it's made it so that I that anyone can get to me at any time, and they basically like can call me or text me or need something and if i don't get back to them in you know five minutes for some reason that escalates that that escalates into something that like is you know a much much bigger deal than it really is so what i would say is this it's very simple is that you need to pick out the industry you want to work in first right and then you need to start from the bottom and work your way up and you have to pay you have to pay your dues you've got to pay your dues and you got to put your work in i started you know in action sports i started at the bottom of the bottom stocking you know and i started at a surf and surf and skateboard shop starting like doing every single piece of grunt work i can do anything they needed anything they wanted done i did and i just did it all the way through up i worked my way up next thing you know i'm on the floor next thing you know i'm selling things next thing you know i'm a buyer buying you know buying the skateboards and the you know the in the and the apparel for the shop because i had been there long enough to know what was working what wasn't working then from there you know i learned how you know to become a a better salesman that would move me outside of that position to a company now right and then so as I'm as I'm looking to go, do I want to go the sales route or do I want to go the marketing route? Well, I chose the marketing route, which was even harder to get into because there's less money and more competition. So the only way that that happened was that I did the same thing is that I said, hey, look, I'll start. I'll help do sales. I'll hold the camera equipment, you know. Uh, well, no, I mean, this, this really went, went down is I'll, 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 I'll do the sales. You don't have to pay me for sales. I'll be a salesman. You don't have to pay me for sales, but I just want to work in marketing, too. And that meant like doing anything that the team needed, anything, and that and that that escalated from that to becoming you know a team manager, which is basically means that I'm taking care of all the athletes, making sure they got their boxes, making sure that they got their, all everything, the same stuff I do right now. And you know, then I went from that to hey, we need some product shot, we need some, we need some. Um, catalog photo shot we need some action photo shot i need you to go work with this photographer to go get this done so i would go and i would help the photographer out and i started realizing oh i could shoot these things myself too hey well would you guys invest in giving me a camera if i go look give me get me a camera i will shoot everything you know it will take me a little bit of time i swear i'll, I'll figure out how to mm. use it and i did i went to the bookstore and I, I i bought like 30 different books on how to shoot you know photos i talked to people i did my research i learned and became a photographer and that led me into the marketing role i was in t-shirt designs need to be done right we had to we had, we it, it, this was an apparel company i worked for so they needed t-shirt designs well t-shirt designs also cost money you know you got to get the pay designer to to uh to design t-shirts for you well hey look can I work on some designs? I'm very artistic. I've done some t-shirt designs in the past. Can I submit some of my own stuff? I would sit there, work till three in the morning on t-shirt designs. And out of the 40 t-shirt designs that were going up on the wall, five of them were mine. You know, So those five t-shirt designs now that, oh, that got stuck in the line, two of them were grand slams. You know what? Hey, can you do some more t-shirt designs? Now I'm doing t-shirt designs. Now I'm doing photography. Now I'm managing athletes. Now I'm becoming a marketing man. Make yourself indispensable. So you need to be able to be a 360 asset to any company that you're at. And you can't just go in there expecting that you're going to be able to hang out with pro people and just be that guy that's going to be sitting at, uh, you know, at, at any event taking a photo with him because you're cool. That's not how I got where I got. I got where I got because I worked my ass off, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to, like, go to the end of the earth to make sure that that brand gets what it needs and it and i don't fail and i and i don't let people down and i stay i stay no matter what till the job is done 
You know, so in, in a world of people wanting to get this instant gratification and thinking that because if they're going to, you know, they're going to follow somebody around or they're going to be around somebody that that's going to happen for them, they still need to figure out how to utilize all the tools to go where they need to go. I can't just pick up one of your weapons and pretend that I'm going to be able to be some super operator <laughs> that's going to be able to go and do some defense work for somebody. That's just not going to happen. You could, but with video coming in now, you'd, you'd be exposed. Just like anything else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. You know. It's crazy. No, it's well said. I mean, it, you know, it goes without saying. I could spend two more hours with you talking about this stuff. Because well, I'll be back soon. We can it, keep on going. Yeah. Uh, we went 90 minutes. Q, um, I, I think we hit everything. Um, I want to get Hans shooting. I want to get him shooting some guns. I want to get over to the range. I had an awesome time. I mean, this is this is a blast. I mean, my mind is is going in a hundred directions. But I had a lot of fun chatting with you, and I and I really would love to have you back in to do a follow up to Anytime. talk more stuff. Anytime. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I want you to shout out your brands. Where people well, I'm going to do this you. first. Yeah, I'm gonna, sure. I'm going to as you continue. To yeah, I want I want to have you shout out your brands where people can find you. There it is. Uh, Q's pulling up now. That's it. That's all. The, that's all that matters right there. Just go to that. So. I had I had like such a right blast, here. and I can't thank you enough for coming down. It's been, you know, a huge eye-opening experience getting able to get in your head and get some insights and get some understanding of what's going on. Um, you know, you got a great story, Hans. Thank and you. It's it's one of those things we haven't even scratched the surface, and I look forward to having you back in and just what you've. Um, accomplished and what you've done is, is definitely something a lot of folks can look at and say, you know, you're absolutely right. Start at the bottom, work your ass off, get in a position that you can be successful, put successful people around you and good stuff will happen. And I, you know, it's a message that everybody definitely should take in, especially in a, in a sports genre that you're in where people struggle so hard to make a living and find a way to make a living. Um, you know, I'm around the gyms, I'm around the mats. There's guys, every, everyone thinks they're going to be a pro and make a million dollars. And it's, you know, you want to tell them, you better have a plan B. You yeah. know, you better have a backup plan. And, you know, it's just one of those things. But uh, I can't thank you enough for coming down. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to come on a very cool thing like this. It's yeah, a, I mean, I hope you love the studio and love it I here do. at KVAR. It's, it's, it's um, a very, very cool. We're going to get you to the range. We're going to do some shooting. And uh, I want to thank KVAR. Everyone head over to KVAR.com. Make sure you check out the thank website. Thank you, KVAR. And um, make sure... Uh, I think I thanked everyone. Thank you, Q. Take <laughs> us out. We out.